What's up, Rockstars? Today we have a huge news video. We have some crazy drama with employees posting under, like, not stolen credentials, but they definitely needed, the creator needs to change their login and password. That's all I'm saying there. We have an update to the D&D OGL, some final conclusive things, and we gotta talk about that. And just some huge major games, some big IP, so let's discuss. Alright, starting things out with Grey Wind's Guide to Therador. It is a 5e compatible game. That's right, we are still making 5e compatible content. You can't stop us. Uh, this is huge. It's by DM Stash, which is one of my favorite STL uh, 3D print companies. Uh, they make some great, great stuff. They really do. 130 plus STLs, plus uh, a whole bunch of other kind of miniatures, th three huge 5e campaign sagas, a source book, maps, subclasses, magic items, so much more. It is the completes. It is the whole thing. And that's why they already have over a thousand followers and they just launched this darn thing. So it's going to be massive. It really, really is. And if you don't have a 3D printer and you don't know about DM Stash, they do some fantastic stuff. Let's go and take a quick look uh, at this. And I'll link down to this below, but they kind of go over a lot of what's in there. But as you can see, just some huge quality stuff as soon as it loads. All right, so here is a kind of a better picture. You can get kind of a sense of what you're getting here. This Hex Hunters of Brightstone is a January 5e campaign that they're doing there. So they do this kind of stuff all the time where they have all the different uh, images that you could possibly want to kind of look at to see uh, just the different riddles and different, you know, uh, stat blocks and all sorts of stuff. So they do a ton. They really, really do. And if you don't want to print them or you can't, then you want to go to Game Work Create and they can print it for you. Not only can you toss them an STL and have them print anything you want, but if you go under Artists, under DM Stash, they have a ton of stuff already. If you want to print the Fallen Empire, all you got to do is come here and then you can actually get all of these kind of minis printed and shipped straight to you it's a great printing service they are sponsoring this video and i couldn't be happy to have them as part of the channel sponsors because they do great great work so feel free to check them out they got a ton of minis you can just buy straight up you don't have to worry about no 3d printed nothing you can just be set to go moving on from that we have marvel united multiverse this is interesting first of all it's at 1.8 million right now if you didn't know the first one was at about 2.8 ish million 2.9 million somewhere around there and then the x-men one just like exploded it was over five million and part of that was because there was all the stuff that was available from the first one as well and once people got excited for it and then they went for it and x-men sells it's like printing money x-men's awesome we all know x-men's awesome so this one is kind of interesting because it's already i think going and i think it's definitely going to pass probably the uh the uh, first one but i don't think it's going to beat x-men even though it has the x-men plus more for sale so it actually is a higher price point uh, it's just the appeal isn't quite there and at some point people just have enough and kaban is actually like delivering games they don't just like launch campaigns um except for a few that they've had issues with so really they're just making the games and buying so people already have these games so it, it gets kind of hard to keep selling the same thing over and over again it, you do get eventual diminishing returns plus uh, at some point you just have used up a lot of the ip and i think that's kind of where a lot of people feel right now but it's doing very very well and i wanted to kind of point out something here first of all twelve thousand backers is fantastic there needs to be one more backer 10 days left to go so i expect it to kind of increase a little bit they have some of the new uh, characters here. Let me go ahead and show a little bit of them off. Like Wiccan is awesome. I really dig that. Kid Loki, that's a fun one. Uh, Red Hulk love red hulk what a what a great i i i once read a punisher red hulk combo fantastic combo <laughs> i can tell you that much um okay so they've added silver war this is a new one i think they haven't shown before and i really appreciate that they follow the comics a lot like you actually get a goliath mini well he was not a big part of the civil war story in its length it's because of stuff that happened to him. And all I can say is that he was definitely a catalyst for a lot of Civil War. A very important, pivotal role in the escalation of that in the comics. So it's really cool to see them really laying into that, if that makes sense. The only bummer is the lack of uh, the Punisher. Uh, he was definitely a part of that and had one of my favorite scenes with him in Spider-Man and Captain America. But that's besides the point. The point is that they're doing a lot of service to the uh, the uh, Marvel comics. 
And I think that's awesome. You'll also notice there's a $40 expansion, two 35s, a 30, and two 15s. That's just for this campaign. That puts it at right under $300. With shipping, you're going to be at over $300 to get that shipped to you, uh, no matter where you live, pretty much. So FYI on that. And then they actually have now offered these optional buys, these promo bundles, right? So you get to the Marvel United or you get the Marvel United plus X-Men or you get to the uh, mutant promos, which is cool, or the Fantastic Four that was previously available. So there's uh, you can still get retail stuff, of course. Always look at retail stuff. But there you go. You have this here. Now this puts it right at around 700. So that's kind of what you're looking at to get if you just want it all and you want a whole bunch of stuff, this will get you a large portion of that. And it's right around 700. This is easily going to be a thousand dollar game. Uh, I think if you just wanted every single thing you could possibly get, uh, that's just kind of what it's going to be end up what, what you're spending. So keep that in mind, obviously spend responsibly, but guys, if you like, if you like the game, I know a lot of you do, and I know some of you don't. Um, or if you like Marvel, if you just like painting the minis, whatever it is, I don't care. Just have fun and enjoy. But do spin responsibly. Man, I talked long enough. We got the 666. Mission accomplished. Moving on from that. Batman Escape from Arkham Asylum. Very, very interesting. So we're almost at 500,000. So they're doing quite good for themselves. Uh, that being said, they only have 2,174 backers. Compare that to the Marvel United at 12,666 now. So definitely low on the backer count. It's just a very expensive game. <laughs> and that's really unfortunate for them. It really is the fact that only 2,000. And I want, they didn't get their game out, right? They don't have a lot of previews or, or prototypes or anything like that. There's a ton of just general knowledge missing when it comes to like how the miniatures are going to end up and stuff like that there does seem to be a larger focus on the miniatures but i mean you know it could be argued the same with like marvel united like every single image they have has miniatures in it it's the first thing you see is like miniatures and then miniatures and then more miniatures and then a whole list of miniatures so i like i think people get stuck up on that a lot like if you got miniatures you're gonna show them off they sell well um especially an ip one but there's just a lot of questions and not a lot of outreach, um, uh, just in general. And then with their their past, with like the Harry Potter campaign and stuff like that, it just seems to be a real like uh, I don't. know, They're not good at selling the product that they make. Hopefully that makes sense. You can make the product, but then selling it, it can sometimes be different skill sets. Another interesting thing that they're doing here is they are unlocking a vending machine. That's a boring freaking unlock. Uh, that's not going to push a whole lot. I can tell you that much. Stuff like this, the Batman Who Laughs, uh, yes, that's definitely going to that's that's gonna work. That being said, that wasn't even a monetary one. That was just a day four unlock. So it, it's kind of interesting. They have Heath Ledger, Joker, by the way, now, which is super cool. They did add a new expansion. That's a large reason of why they went up. So this Batman heirs of the, how do I say that? Heirs of the cow? I always say that wrong. It is about 43 USD. It's actually 4346 currently right now. And as an FYI, it has some great looking minis. Their designs of the minis are cool. I really like this Batgirl. That's really fun. This Red Hood is freaking sweet. And then Robin with the dual blades is a joy to see as well. Um, and the fact that they even have Red Robin in it shows how kind of deep they're going in here. And an orphan too. She's, she's actually fairly new now. Um, newer than pretty much all these others, but FYI, this is an expansion for the Batman Quest of Arkham Asylum. It's an expansion for the expansion. So if you're not getting uh this one, right, and if you recall, this is the one that at solo mode allows you to play as heroes. Um, then you you don't want to get it. You want to only get it if you're also getting this. So it's kind of a pair there. Now what this allows you to do, because this only came with one mini. So it didn't give you a lot of options for actually like, uh, you know, playing as a whole bunch of heroes, but this does add a whole bunch. You can play a, what they call a full cooperative experience of it. So it is pretty cool in that sense. That being said, as an alternate mode, it's not something I will be interested in, though I do uh, really like those minis and I'll be very jealous that I don't get them, but I won't be backing either of those. I am still at kind of this level right here. So we'll see how things go from there. Now, this is an interesting one. AI generated card game, Fog of Adventure. Now, a few things here. First of all, Fog of Adventure is the last thing they mention. Up front, the very first thing they say is AI. 
AI generated card game. That's how they're advertising this, how they're pushing this. And so that's kind of an interesting take as well. Now, this is not going to fund. It has 3,000 arrays, it needs 48,000. A lot of that, stripping up the AI, we'll talk about the AI, a lot of that is just because it's just not presented well. Uh, you know, they don't have any outreach or anything like that of any kind. Really, they're, they're just kind of list. I mean, their shipping and budget is like the majority of this this whole whole thing. Otherwise, it's just a few little bullet points. How to play? There you go. That's how you play right there. Uh, so that's kind of lackluster. But let's talk about the AI part here. Um, because it's kind of interesting, right? So this game was created using AI, and that's the only thing they say about it on the campaign page. So. First of all, this again, like I said, they're just not explaining enough. There is a zero FAQ. There's no updates. There's only 10 comments. So it's very bare bones. Let's go to that comment, though. Somebody actually asked a question, which is great. Thanks, Tabletop Gaming's blog. I appreciate it. They asked, hey, how was AI involved? Do you say it's involved? Like, how so? And Philip actually gives quite a bit of responses. For instance, he used Dolly 2, which is for images, and ChatGPT, which is for uh, discussion or the creation of text. And uh, he says that he uses it as a very helpful tool in the creative process. And as a creator, he actually has like a lot of respect for the AI and how he can use that tool. And there, are, there's a lot like that, right? There are some people who are like, I use this, and this is what I use, this is what I do, and that's it. And then there are other people that are very much like a grabbing new things all the time and seeing new things and be like, I could use that, I can use that, and I can use that. Pros and cons to both, of course. There's just different people out there. This guy is definitely the kind that's like, AI, how can I use that to help kind of create, right? And so what he said is that the AI has generated art that has inspired him to create cards and other elements such as icons and text uh, or textures. I don't know, again, what that means. Does that mean that he used it to create AI art? and that he also then was inspired to make some, or is he just creating art to inspire him to then make all the art? Uh, I, I don't know. He, again, it's not, not a whole lot of detail there. Um, this talks about the, the text and how it's written. However, the game mechanics have less AI involvement so far. So the actual game mechanics is mostly him. He did say, however, that it created a, like a difficulty setting for balance. And that was something it thought of that he hadn't thought of. So he's using it as kind of a, uh, uh, a person to talk to, if that makes sense, to bounce ideas off of and stuff like that. The AI has played a significant role in creating the presentation for my Kickstarter campaign as well, which this is the thing I felt was lackluster, including writing the script for the trailer. It even this text I am writing you has been aided by the AI. It's like all the YouTubers that like are like psych that actually you've been listening to the AI script the whole time, kind of thing. Um, because yeah, I'll talk about itself if you ask it to. Let me know what you guys think on this. Uh, first of all, I wish it wasn't so vague. I think especially in today's climate with how people feel about AI, especially a lot of creatives, uh, well, really a lot of artists that feel quite threatened and and kind of um, uh, used, I think is probably a, a good a good way to word it, um, that you, know, you, you need to kind of really be upfront about this AI. And they're upfront about it being with AI here, but uh, to title it something like that isn't necessary to disclaim, it's to advertise, right? He's definitely viewing this as AI is an awesome thing, it's helped me do this, and you would be interested in it too because I'm interested in it. And that's kind of how we related it here. It's not kind of fun, like I said, but it's very interesting to see uh, an AI-generated board game, a card game. That's very interesting. Okay, let's talk about Subterra. I'm gonna get comfortable here. Okay, all right, you guys ready for this? You guys, okay, this is, um, grab your popcorn, maybe grab a drink, pause the video, get comfortable, get ready, let's go. Okay, the January update of Subterra 2, the game that has been long overdue, that made almost 300,000 pounds a long time ago, still was not delivered, and I'm sure they made more in their pledge manager. Now, this is the whole update. It is actually from Peter, the person that owns and runs inside the box board games, the person that was being talked about by the last time I updated to you on this, from the last update. Now, he essentially, and you can go on and pause and read, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he says nothing. There's no update here. There's no information. He says, I'm not in a position to give you concrete information on exactly when games will ship, in what order, etc., as I promised not to do so unless I was 100% confident in the results. But what he can say is that there are specific significant progress that has been made. Now, before I move on from this, 
you just because you can't predict the future doesn't mean you can't tell us the current. That is 100%. 100% where you're at right now is 100%. That's how that works. So it's a total BS, total plate spinning, total, you know, kicking the bucket down a little bit farther. I just hit my wall. I'm so upset. <laughs> um, to, to say, oh, uh, you know what? In February, babe, I'll tell you something. But this has zero info in there. Zero. He's not telling you what he's been doing. He's not telling you what he did. He's not telling you anything like that. He's just saying, hey, I have no information. But guess what? I wrote an update. And I told you I'd write an update. As he promised, he said I'd write an update by the end of January. Here's your update. This is not an update. This is nothing it it has no substance there is zero substance to this update i can glean nothing from this backers get nothing from this it is a waste of your time to post this it's a waste of everybody's time to read this it will not help anything to say nothing to anybody and it, it, it doesn't even address the last update it's like they're oblivious like they're not even reading comments they don't even care now that is for the concrete information. It's total BS, of course. That's flawed logic, just through and through, objectively bad logic there. You can talk about current stuff, like hard stuff. You can do that. I promise you can. Even if it, it, this specific and significant progress, prove it. Prove it. Otherwise, that's BS. In fact, I know it's BS because this seems like a great maybe update maybe you think you know what no it's great that there was significant specific progress made for sub terra 2 until you go to his other thing where he has the copy paste same thing so does that mean that the specific significant progress was made for aquanauts or for sub terra or maybe it was for alba an open world adventure book that was also copy pasted this man peter has obviously done nothing. If you do something, you can share it. If you haven't done nothing, you can't share it. It's as simple as that. But it's just unfortunate that, what is this, 272,794 for 10,000 backers, plus 32,035, plus 291,984, plus all the pledge manager, pledge, pledge manager money from all of those as well. God, come on now. Come on now. What does this dude just make a million bucks and do what with it? Give you an update, copy paste like this, saying that there's specific significant progress that's been made on which of the games that you haven't delivered. Which one? Which all of them? They've all had specific significant progress. It's BS. It's BS. It's an insult. It's a slap in the face. Peter should not even bother writing this. He may as well just laugh his way off to the bank like he has been all these years. Ridiculous ridiculous and a pathetic excuse for an update pathetic peter you can do better anybody could do better my goodness what a joke speaking of <laughs> guys public fighting is is impressive so if you didn't know this was somebody that was posting in the comments and they were trying to get peter's attention and guess what peter doesn't talk to nobody Nobody. They've Even the collaborator that wrote the last update I shared with you guys was like, hey, how about you email us so we can like talk and maybe I can help you? Nothing. 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 You're going to get nothing from Peter, including payment for your work. Uh, that's right. Inside the box, board games does not pay their employees. Keep that in mind so that, uh, yeah, they're never, they don't have a future at all, obviously. Um, so apparently he has not changed his login information and this ex-employee knows it and was able to log in, uh, post a few uh, comments as inside the box board games and has now posted an update that is permanent. It, you cannot edit it. You cannot delete it. Maybe Kickstarter can. I don't know. I'm sure they can. I mean, they, they can veto anything, right? But uh, it, once it's like, what is it like? It's a couple minutes, 30 minutes after, something like that. Either way, at some point, you can't even edit your updates. They are locked in. You can't change it. And so this is says, pay your ex-employees, Peter. Peter still owes his employees wages, missing pension, and redundancy. And that's it. And then they posted it. And so it's there. <laughs> change your password, Peter. <laughs> no, Peter, don't change your password. This is too rich. This is great. This has more information than Peter's update. At least now we know something. Peter didn't pay his employees. Perfect. Good. I'm glad we know something concrete. 
he can actually share that. So that's 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 great. There you go. There's your update. Dear Lord, some of these company companies, I say company loosely. They're just doing you wrong, guys. They're doing you wrong, and I apologize for it. What I can and sure I can do is make sure that I can do my part and making it to where nobody ever falls for anything Peter does again. So if I see him in any other company, if I see him to the box board games again, better believe I'll cover it. Give you guys a shout out. Let you guys know. Warn you guys off. Don't mess with it. It's not worth it. It's a joke. It's what it is. All right, let's talk about something a little bit more positive. Let's talk about the OGL 1.A and how it is forever, just like it always was, but even though some people try to pretend it wasn't. Okay, so first bit, I'm actually going to read the green first. We are leaving the OGL 1.0A 1 in place as is untouched. Okay, well, I mean, good, because you can't touch it even if you want to, but whatever. You know what? Props. At least you're admitting that now. And we are also making the entire SRD 5.1 available under a Creative Commons license. Now that's huge. If you didn't know, to catch you up, uh, D and D, Wizards of the Coast that owns it, Hasbro who owns them, who owns you know it, it goes on in chain. Wanted to update the 1.0 A. The 1.0 A is kind of like a a nice agreement between Wizards of the Coast and its community to kind of play nice together. Is I guess the best way I can describe it. It's very much not even necessarily necessary that's kind of a bad sentence on my part but you get what i'm saying like it, it's not even required for you to really do what you're doing per se but it does ensure gives you that little bit of confidence knowing that you guys are kind of in an agreement you're not going to get like hounded by wizards of the coast for what you're doing which is kind of nice because big companies can throw their weight around eat whether they're right or wrong and definitely abuse the legal system to make your life miserable so kind of having that kind of relationship even if it's just a more formality is very good. It reminds me kind of a, a handshake, right? You can still betray the person, but he did shake hands on it, man. I mean, come on, don't betray him. Okay, so speaking of betrayal, they tried to update that, and re abolish the 1.0a, rewrite a new one, and do a lot of changes in that. And we're going to be talking about that in a little bit. But but a lot of it was also that the SRD 5.1 was kind of more locked up too, which is really the the whole, that's the rule set for D&D &D really, right? Now, what they've done now, is they've released it under the Creative Commons license. And in fact, by simply publishing it, they said they've placed it under an irrevocable Creative Commons license. That means that it is forever free. Now, that is just the 5.1. They could make a 5.2 that isn't under there or something like that, right? I mean, there's always ways around these things, but at least the 5.1 is locked in. So I, I, I want to give credit for that. And really credit for us as a community. Uh, the, the internet community, by and large, really uh, let them know that they were not, not happy with this. That this was not okay by consumer standards. Or even their partners or the companies that really help them be who they are. And make most of the content for d and It's actually not all by Wizards of the Coast. They do make quite a bit, but they are way outnumbered by all the people supporting them. All the companies supporting them. And they kind of slap them in the face and... They were told <laughs> just as much. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a very big win. This is probably the biggest win on the internet for like internet nerds since I guess the um, the Zack Snyder uh, release. <laughs> so, uh, for however your opinion is on that, like it was definitely a, a hey, let's hound them until they they listen. Let's talk about this though. So first of all, 15,000 people filled out the survey. That is a very small number. That is barely more than the people currently backing a Come On Kickstarter. And this is D&D. &D. So very, very small subset of people, right? So that right away. And I don't know how they did the survey. I don't know if it was with D&D &D Beyond or what. I'm not sure. But the results are kind of interesting here. It says 88% do not want to publish a TTRPG under the OGL 1.2. Um, I'm surprised it's only 88. 90% would have to change some aspect of their business to come at OGO 1.2. Um, uh, again, I, I suspect the number is actually less than that, like a lot less than that. But of the people that are going to respond to this, a lot of them, most of them are going to be people that are negatively affected by it, if that makes sense. So that, uh, like that stat makes sense, but obviously they're not like, you know, this isn't like a, a huge, large, 
uh, pool set. This is just whoever happened to respond, right? So, you know, that, that, that's kind of a given. 89% are dissatisfied with the deauthorizing of OGO 1.0a. Again, kind of interesting that, that, you know, people are, apparently 11% of people said, no, that is actually great that you're uh, deauthorizing the old 1.0a. I, I don't understand what that means, but whatever. And then 86% are dissatisfied with the draft VTT policy. You know, the, the interesting thing here is that none of those, none of those address all of the issues. For instance, a lot of people were worried about the, um, oh, how to word this, the uh, uh, political correctness clauses that are kind of in there where it talked about, you know, hey, like don't have like racism, you know, in uh, a positive light, stuff like that. I think it's, a lot of it was very common sense stuff. A lot of people were worried that it could be abused because it could be. It was worded in a way to where uh, really Wizards of the Coast could just pick and choose whatever they wanted. Right. And they're going to keep it that way. But nothing in here kind of mentioned that. And they did talk about before how they actually want to keep pursuing that just in some other way. So I'll still monitor this. I'll let you guys know where this ends up. What was the coast is planning uh, to do? Uh, let, let's not pretend that this is like super genuine. And what I mean by that is they're doing this because they were forced to do this because they were losing a lot of money. We actually have internal emails of people mentioning this, that, you know, hey, they were watching their subscriptions and they were seeing their subscriptions, their paid subscriptions drop drastically. And they saw all the negative backlash, all the bad PR, all the companies pulling away, which Orc is still on, so they're good there. And they realized they made a boo-boo and did a quick course spread, but they did it because of finances. You see, companies don't care. You know, when, when it, it's it's kind of ironic to see stuff like the no racism, you know, so, stuff like that, because it makes it seem almost like Wizards of the Coast is a person. Wizards of the Coast is not a person, and its only language is money. So if it is against stuff like racism, it's not because Wizards of the Coast as a company somehow like values inclusiveness. What they do is they value money, and money is where you know, they think they can get it and they think that they can get it by pushing away the racism stuff, mainly because they think they could lose it if, if somehow they were like to condone it or, or, you know, get some of that kind of stuff. But don't pretend that any decision they make is based off anything, but their, their, their dollars, right? Their money that they're making. That is the sole reason that they're changing this. It was the sole reason they did it to begin with the whole 1.1, its whole purpose was for money. The whole revert back to 1.08 is whole purpose for money. Not because they feel sorry. There's no apology here, right? There's there's no we're sorry anywhere here at all. Because that would involve emotion and not just cold hard currency. They're looking at their budget and they're deciding this is the best course of action to continue to make as much money as we possibly can right now. And that's why they did it. So it's great. It's a good win. Just know that it's 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 also all still fake. Just like the original. Uh, the, the, they don't care. <laughs> they, they don't. It's just not how this works. So anyway, anyway, guys, that's it. That's all I have for you for this time. Again, go check out Game Work Create. There's a whole bunch of Kickstarter board games on there too. You can go and check that out. Also, uh, they are a great sponsor for this channel. If there's anything I missed, if you have any opinions on that AI create a game, that's very interesting. Or maybe if you are a victim of uh, the Subterra fiasco or you have some thoughts on that, do let me know. I do appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Take care. Bye, guys.